let's talk about conversational pathways. If you were preparing to do evangelism, let me give you a challenge. The challenge would be to pick one topic and to memorize, at least roughly memorize, three verses. Okay? Um, so I'm just going to hit the ground running right now, and I want you all to be, please stop me and tell me what you're interested in. But the first thing I'd say is it's good to practice sharing the gospel with a view toward the whole story. Right? So I, I love, if I have a few minutes, to talk about how there's a promise in Genesis 3.15. This is so beautiful. This is a curse, but it's also a promise. God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. It's very early on. There's an expectation throughout the Old Testament that someday God would send an offspring. Who's the offspring? So throughout the whole Old Testament, we have a series of patriarchs and kings, and there's a kind of stacking of promises. God says to Abraham, I'm going to bless all the nations through you. And in Deuteronomy, God tells Moses, I'm going to send a prophet like you, but he, the way he speaks about him, he's... He's bigger than Moses. He's better than Moses. He's bigger than Moses. Um, God makes a promise to David that one of his offspring would someday come and establish a kingdom. Uh, and yet this king would be greater than David. A lord over David and yet a descendant of David. So you have all these promises. You have, you have, you have this promise to Israel. Um, if you keep my commandments, I will bless you. And if you don't keep all my commandments in this Mosaic covenant, I will curse you and exile you. And when that happens, <laughs> someday when you're exiled, I'm going to regather my people. And I'm going to give them the Holy Spirit, cause them to keep the commandments. I'm going to establish a kingdom that cannot be shaken. This is called the new covenant, the new covenant. And so the whole Old Testament is anticipating the coming of an offspring who is born of a virgin, who is a suffering servant, Isaiah 53, crushed for our iniquities. Um, Isaiah 53 is a beautiful picture of what this offspring is going to be. He is going to be greater than David and yet a descendant of David, someone through whom all the, uh, the, the nations are blessed, and he's an offspring that's going to crush Satan. And so God, he just he makes this promise and then he adds up on the promise. He stacks the promises upon promises. And so when the people are back in uh, the promised land, they do rebuild a temple, but it's pretty pitiful. God's people weep. The, the older men who had seen the prior temple wept over the pitiful reconstruction of this temple and over the Roman rule, the oppressive Roman rule. And God's people were still waiting for this offspring. Then there was a little baby boy born of a virgin. And the way he grew up is he spoke and he spoke with authority, not like the scribes. When he spoke, his words were more than just truthful. They were effective. They were powerful. His demons who saw him coming and said, have you come to torment us before the appointed time? And Jesus would just say, go. And the demons would rush out and drown in a lake, Jesus would say things like, your sins are forgiven. Get up and walk on out. And he would heal the blind and give a, a, a man working legs who was lame. And this, this Jesus who said things like, I am the way, the truth, and the life, this offspring, he set his face toward Jerusalem and he was lifted up on a cross and cursed and killed as though a shameful criminal. And this Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then they buried him in a tomb purchased by a particular man. His name is Joseph of Arimathea. 
And three days later, three, three Jewish days, two nights later, this Jesus rose from the dead. And a cloud of witnesses saw Jesus. They, Jesus appeared to them and he invited them to touch him and feel his very wounds. And Jesus said, someday he's coming back to judge the living and the dead. This is the offspring who became a curse for us. This is the Messiah who is God in the flesh who will someday judge you. And if you want to be right with God, you can either have your shame swallowed up by the cross that he died on, the work that he did, the, the righteousness that he performed, the forgiveness that he purchased. You can either be secure in the person of Jesus or you can pay for your own sins. And someday you're going to meet him. You see, Genesis 3.15 is a great starting point for the gospel. It starts with a promise. It ends with a person. Another uh, pathway is God, the gospel. And I'm going to tell you, uh, if you were to ask me 15 years ago, what's your favorite verse to share on the nature of God with Latter-day Saints? You probably would have heard what? You guys, you guys probably know this. Isaiah 43, 10. ten. Before me, no God was formed, neither shall there be any after me. It's a, it's a great verse. I don't have it listed here. Uh, it's a great contradistinction to the Lorenzo Snow Couplet, who says, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may be. It's very different. In the Bible, there's one God, and there's never been any other gods formed, and that God becomes a man. In Mormonism, uh, men become gods who help men become gods who help men become gods, and those men ascend to godhood. It's not that God condescends to manhood. It's very different. So Isaiah 43, 10 is great. But what I've been using lately on the street that I have found very helpful is Isaiah 40, verse 14. Isaiah 40, verse 14 says of God, who, whom did he consult? You think about kings. Uh, a king in a court typically has, um, what do you call him? The president has his advisors, his, advisor, his cabinet. Uh, does God have a cabinet? Does God consult? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? The God of Isaiah 40 never learned. He knows everything but learned nothing. In the Latter-day Saint classic worldview, we don't want to superimpose this on every individual Latter-day Saint, but in the classic Latter-day Saint worldview, everything that God knows he learned. And in some variations, he's still learning. The God of the Bible learned nothing. And this is a, this is a, uh, this is a zero-sum comparison. This is not something you can vary. It's not like you could squeeze it and it gets just more or less. It's just categorically yes or no. He knows everything, learned nothing. Or he learned something. There's two different categories of being here. God's the sort of being who never learned and never will learn. And I hope you understand, like, when I'm sharing this, this isn't just like a debate tactic or a deconstructive method. This is like, this is glory. And so there's, there's, there's pleasure in evangelism even when it's not quote-unquote effective or productive or fruitful by worldly external standards. Um, there is a pleasure that believers have in the gospel and in glorying in who God is. Um, that's, that's the promise of Isaiah, that someday God's people would boast in God. We're, that's what we do in evangelism. We're boasting and we're glorying in how great God is. Romans 11, verse 36 is a good summary. Uh, God gets all the best prepositions for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Wow. Wow. If all things are from him and therefore they depend on him for existence, the, the through depends on the from. Does that make sense? If, if something is not created by God, it doesn't need to be sustained by God. But if something's from God, if, if God created from his own power without any external dependencies, if God uh, can create by the word of his own power, then whatever he creates continues to be dependent on him for its existence. And therefore, all things are from him and through him. And if all things are from and through him, they have an end. They have a, they have a purpose for which they were made. 
there's something they're aimed at, the two. Um, this is what philosophers call the final cause. It's the purpose for which something exists. It's the telos. Uh, to him. Why does something exist? It's to him. All things are from him, through him, and to him. And then Revelation 4.8. Um, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. I talked to a Latter-day Saint a couple weeks ago about this. And he said, the Bible doesn't make it clear whether or not Heavenly Father was a sinful mortal. We don't know. Well, well, he had a position that he never was, but the Bible doesn't make it clear, he said. So I brought him to this. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So why do we worship God? Why? In part because he is the supreme, unique, eternal, magnificent, most high, incomparable, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise Simple being from whom are all things is the ground of all being. He, he is incomparable. He's never learned. All things derive their existence from him and he's always been holy. No, he's always been holy, holy, holy. Who was and is and is to come. So that's in contradistinction to a God who learned. It's in contradistinction to a God who is a regional, cosmic, tribal deity who's over one branch of the family tree of the gods. If there are other worlds under other gods with different dominions and different jurisdictions, then there are things that are not from through into our God. They're from through into another God. Not all things in that case would be from through into God. And if God was a mortal who had yet to become a god going under a mortal, mortal probationary experience. I, it's harder to stereotype, but many Latter-day Saints um, say that perhaps Heavenly Father was a sinful mortal. We, they'll say, we don't know, or maybe or probably he was. If you wanted to learn more about that, there's a street interview project I've done uh, called GodNeverSinned.com where I've asked Latter-day Saints on the street, is it possible, the wording is very particular here, is it possible that Heavenly Father was once perhaps a sinful mortal? I've got a variety of answers. A variety of answers. There's even a whole page on a Mormon apologetic site. Let's see here. It's this one right here. Where they answer the question, this is a Latter-day Saint website. If God was once like us, does that mean he was once a sinner? And they say, ah, speculation. We don't really know. Some people say no. <coughs> For some, that the idea that God may have once been a sinner gives us added hope. <laughs> and faith in the atonement. But then they ask, does it really matter that much? So why? That's one of my punchy questions, if I'm feeling extra bold. Do you think Heavenly Father might have been a sinful mortal prior to his exaltation? If you think sinners like you and me can become gods, what about Heavenly Father's past? Well, we don't really know. It's a mystery. But do you think it's possible that he might have been a sinful mortal? Are there gods receiving proper worship? that have once been sinners. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's, so that's, that's a three-verse pathway for who God is. Never learned. Okay, spend too much time on that. Grace is a very difficult topic to talk about because of the semantic domain. Uh, the words in this topic have sort of flexible meanings within Latter-day Saint culture. <coughs> it's really hard to nail down this topic. So what I encourage you to do is focus on the person of David, that man after God's own heart who was an adulterer and a murderer, right? In the Latter-day Saint historic faith, 
David is not finally and fully forgiven. He is permanent in, in DNC 132. I think that's the right section. It says that David has permanently lost his exaltation. Um, and in the Joseph Smith translation, Nathan's uh, confrontation with David, Nathan says, the Lord has not put away your sin. So he, the, Joseph Smith uh, turns the passage around. And I, I want to show you Romans 4, verse 4, and uh, just read it with me. Now to the one who works, this is an accounting metaphor. Let's just say you're a pizza delivery guy. You're 18 years old. Proud to have your first job. You work your full two weeks. You smell bad. But you got your first paycheck. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. This is contractually obligatory. It's owed to you. It's not a gift. It's a payment. Verse 5, and to the one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So an ungodly person who is not righteous is invited to trust who? The God who justifies the ungodly. But that sort of trust doesn't work for the gift. So you only get this gift if you stop working for it. So to him who does not work, this is for bankrupt, pitiful welfare recipients who have demerited grace. They, they deserve punishment, and they're bad people. There's a cartoon where a character says, you're bad and you should feel bad. Uh, Jesus says, whatever comes out of your mouth comes from your heart. I'm not a good person who does bad things. I'm a bad person who does bad things. Trust him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness. So unrighteous people can be counted as righteous. Godly people can be counted as godly. And what person is showcased? What person is the model, the example the trophy of grace. David, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man who's, uh, against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So can God declare this sort of blessing over a murderer? Yes. And this is a matter of encouragement for believers. If God can forgive David, he can forgive you. Do you think God has this sort of grace for porn addicts and liars and men who blow up with horrible tempers and abusers and men who have abandoned their own kids? Can God forgive scumbags? Totally forgive them and give them grace. <laughs> What's that? He only forgives. He scumbags. only forgives scumbags. <laughs> That's a great way to say it. God only gives this grace to those who declare spiritual bankruptcy, and David is the example for it. Ah, it's beautiful. We don't have time to cover it, but do you remember when this woman came to Jesus and wiped? her feet with his feet with her hair. I think it was Peter who said, do you know what kind of woman this is? If you knew what kind of woman this is, you wouldn't let this happen. And Jesus says, let me tell you a story. There's two guys who had incredible debts, 150 denarii, 1,500 denarii, and the master forgave them both. Which one do you think is more thankful? The one who is forgiven the greater debt. And Jesus goes on to say, the one who is forgiven little, loves little. So the, the big idea here is to take something express and explicit about grace with a particular figure in Scripture who's forgiven that Mormonism uh, disputes over, and then to take examples in the four Gospels where this is illustrated. This isn't a debate point merely. This is gospel. 
This is beauty. Okay, let's do one more to respect your time. Can I ask y'all to tell me what, which of these you're most interested in? This is probably the most common Latter-day Saint topic, um, sort, of, sort of bound up with the questions of priesthood and prophetic office and succession, um, ordinances. So how do you do what you do with the proper authority? Who has the proper authority? That's, in some ways, the Latter-day Saint faith prizes that question over the very nature of God. If you were to ask them, who has the proper authority? To them, that's more, it's typically more important to them than was Heavenly Father a sinful mortal? Does God have multiple wives? Is there an ancestry of deities? Is there a Heavenly Grandfather? Can you become worshipped someday? There's sort of a meh to that, and a who has the proper authority is like, that's, that's a big question. That, that's important. So, okay, okay, we'll, we'll go there. So here's how I talk about this with Latter-day Saints. I have a question I ask. That's the question I ask. To your memory, in the four Gospels, how did Jesus authorize and commission his disciples? What's the Latter-day Saint paradigmatic assumption about how this happens? He he lays his hands on him. Okay. Can you think of anywhere in the four Gospels where Jesus lays his hands on his disciples in order to give them authority? So there's a verb there, ordain or choose. But is there anywhere in the four Gospels where we see hands on others to, to, to officiate, commission, or authorize? That's the, sort of the negative question. It's not there. It's, well, you know, this, okay, look, it's uh, lost. The scriptures have been corrupted. That's why we need modern day prophets. It's not there. You know, that's why the Book of Mormons, that's why, okay, okay. Well, according to what we do have in the four Gospels, how did Jesus authorize and commission his disciples. Do you remember when Jesus comes down the mountain at the end of Matthew 7? Jesus says, well, I'm sorry, the, the crowd says after his sermon, Jesus speaks not like the scribes, but he rather speaks with someone who has authority. He comes down the mountain, and one of the first things that happens is there's a leper who approaches Jesus for healing. How does Jesus heal that man? He does touch him. And that, that's interesting. When Jesus does touch, it's kind of like you might expect him not to, right? Are you supposed to touch a leper as a Jew? Jesus stayed clean. Jesus purified. He's the sort of Messiah who can touch lepers and, re and remain clean. So he, to make a point, to show his authority, he touches the leper, heals the leper. And then shortly after, in Matthew 8, there were two men who had a friend who couldn't walk, and they heard Jesus was in town. Do you remember this story? Do you remember when Jesus is in a house crowded? He's like Justin Bieber popular. They can't get close enough to him. So his friends take him to the roof. They punch some sort of a hole in the, the ceiling, and they lower their friend down, and Jesus looks up, and Jesus is so impressed by their faith, he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. And the riffraff in the back, reason in their heart, who alone has authority to forgive sins but God? And Jesus looks back and he says, I know what you're thinking. What do you think? I, I forget how this goes. What do you think is easier? Is that right? Yeah. To tell a man his sins are forgiven? or to tell a lame man to get up and walk. But to show you that the Son of Man has the authority 
I think I forget the next phrase, to do both. He looks at the man and he says, son, take up your mat and walk. And I like to stop here and be like, do you remember when you were a child and your dad said, go clean your room? Did you ask for papers? Well, I'm going to need to see some authorization, <laughs> sir. His word was enough, and you didn't want his hands laid on you. That's a joke. When your mom said, go wash the dishes, her word was inherently authorizing the command. Well, when Jesus tells uh, a man who's lame to walk on out, his legs obey. His word authorized the miracle. His words authorized the forgiveness. Jesus then gets in a boat. He's in the boat, sleeping like a baby, and the disciples say, ah, Jesus, don't you care about us? We're going to die. And they wake Jesus up, and Jesus looks up at the storm, and he lays his hands on the water. Oh, sorry. He looks up at the storm, and he says, storm, be still. Be quiet. It's as though he was in a uh, a crowded cafeteria with 300 young children, and he said, be quiet. It's a miracle. <laughs> Everyone's, the whole storm just obeyed his words. Then he gets to the other side, and there's these men who are infested with demons, and the demons say, have you come to torment us before the appointed time? Please send us into those pigs. And Jesus says, go. And the demons immediately leave. And then they drown in the lake. Later, Jesus meets Simon, son of John. And Jesus says, you are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Peter. Now, that's quaint. I don't know of any friends who could approach me and say, you're Aaron. You shall now be called Bob. <laughs> who has the authority to give me a new name? I mean, not even a judge can do that by his own words. He has to officiate that with some legal process. When Jesus wants to call you by a new name, he tells you what your new name is. So Jesus was able to heal by the authority of his word, forgive by the authority of his word, command nature by the authority of his word, cast demons out by the authority of his word. He was able to give someone a new name by the authority of his word. And this is, by the way, uh, consistent with how he created the universe. God said, let there be light. And Hebrews 1.3 says of Jesus, but he upholds the universe by the what? By the word of his power. Lazarus, come forth. And a dead man obeys the very words of Jesus. So my question to you, my Latter-day Saint friendly dialogue partner, how did Jesus authorize his disciples to go preach and teach and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Do you remember when Jesus authorized and commissioned his disciples? How, how, in your, how in your framework, in your view, how did Jesus commission his disciples? Well, what's the common assumption? He laid his hands on them. So just open it up. Let's look at it together. Can I show you? Can I show you? This isn't a, do you remember when now? This is a, can I show you? Open it up. Last paragraph of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28. It says, Jesus says, All authority under heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the, name of, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and behold, oh, sorry, teaching them all that I have commanded you, and behold, I will be with you even to the end of the age. So let me ask you, how did Jesus... Uh, I'll give you one more story. We'll be done. And I'll ask that question one more time. In Matthew 8, there was a story I skipped. It was a man who had, I think, a servant who was sick to the point of death, and he sends for Jesus, and he says, Jesus, please heal. It might have been a son or a servant. Jesus says, I will come and heal him. And the servant, or the, the centurion says, oh, no, no. I'm not worthy to have you come inside my front door. Jesus, I'm a man of authority. And I know how authority works. I tell my subordinates, go, and they go, come, and they come, do this, and they do it. I know that all you need to do is say the word, and my servant will be healed. 
And Jesus said, I haven't seen such great faith in all of Israel. So, my Latter-day Saint friend, how did Jesus authorize and commission and forgive and heal and create and sustain and exercise demons and give new names? And how did he commission his disciples? By the word of his mouth. That's the pattern we see. And that is a good segue to the gospel. Jesus says in John 5, verse 24, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, he has eternal life. He has passed from death to life. So here's the challenge. One topic, three verses. I hope that's given you some material to use. Thank you for the extended time with me.